brachial plexus, as you should know, is divided into the interscalene, supraclavicular, infraclavicular, and axillary regions. Roots, trunks at the interscalene, divisions at the supraclavicular, cords at the infraclavicular, and nerve branches at the axillary. And you can see here, I've highlighted in blue, the fibers that are covered when you do the nerve blocks <clears throat> in certain regions. So in the interscalene fossa, you're not getting C8 and T1. Therefore, you would never use this block for something that is um, for a surgery in which C8 and T1 need to be covered. For instance, something involving the ulnar nerve because ulnar nerve gets fibers from C8 to T1. But the supraclavicular is pretty comprehensive. The infraclavicular is comprehensive with a couple of exceptions, which we'll get into soon, and so on with the axillary. Any questions up until this point? Just put them in the chat box if you can. Okay, I'm gonna just do a quick check, see if anyone stuck trying to get into the presentation. Looks like we're good. Okay, moving on. So the interscaling block provides anesthesia of the shoulder, lateral clavicle, chromial clavicular joint, proximal humerus, elbow, but it spares the ulnar nerve. In my practice, and remember I'm a pain physician, mainly I'm doing pain management. I'm using the interscaling nerve block for brachial neuritis, shoulder pain, frozen shoulder. And as an anesthesiologist, we're doing this for any surgeries of the shoulders typically, or anything in the upper extremity in that distribution um, that I discussed previously. Now in the past, when I was in training, I remember being in the OR and my attending was doing the paresthesia technique. This is 2003. Now we had ultrasounds back then, but it wasn't, um, I guess the most common, it was just being, it was, they were just starting to integrate the ultrasound in. This is my first year of training, 2003. I remember we used a blunt needle and we were doing the paresthesia technique. We had the nerve stimulator. I don't know why we didn't use it, but my attending wanted to use just the paresthesia technique. And you go into the groove and you just poke the nerve and you, and you hope for the best. You, you hope that there's gonna be paresthesias and you could aspirate, inject and that you don't damage anything. But you can imagine this is not really the best practice, especially when we have the ultrasound. Then we went on to using the, the uh, nerve stimulators and the nerve stimulators, I remember being at joint disease as, as a resident, they were using the nerve stimulators um, Dave Albert was there and these guys were very slick with it. They didn't get the ultrasound um, around. I mean, I was there when they just got the ultrasound. So the residents were teaching the attendants how to use the ultrasound because it just wasn't part of their flow. And the, the docs at joint, they were super efficient, super quick with the nerve stimulator. But you can imagine, even though that they were great with that, the ultrasound probably saved them time and also reduce the amount of local anesthesia that they would need to do their shots and hopefully reduce the amount of complications. So when moving back to the interscaling block, now this is a, a parasagittal view. You're looking at the patient cut in half and then just scanning just off to the side, like right here. Not the typical interscaling view. This is just for, just for educational purposes. So you're just seeing how close you are to the vertebral artery, the dome of the pleura, the dura covering the cervical spinal cord. The cervical spinal cord is not shown here, but it's very close to where your needle is, relatively speaking. Carotid artery and IJ. It shouldn't be that close, of course, but it's close enough that there have been cases where the local anesthetic has tracked posteriorly to the spinal cord or to these blood vessels. Okay, so here's um, a picture of the cervical, of, excuse me, of the interscalene brachial plexus. C5 is usually the most superficial, then C6 and C7. Okay, here's an image of scanning to find it. So right now we're in the neck and watch the probe move as well as we do this. Okay, we're scanning downwards towards the subclavian or supraclavicular brachial plexus region. And we're imaging that and you'll see how the nerves appear above the vessel and they change in appearance as we go back up 
the neck towards the interscaling fossa once again. When you can't find the interscalings, the best things to do are find, is to find the supraclavicular fossa and brachial plexus or find the carotids, okay? You have your anterior scalene muscles and the nerves, they line up very nicely between this. So you could feel on yourself, it's a pressure point. It's an annoying spot to touch because the nerves are very superficial. One other thing that helps visualize the interscalene brachi brachial plexus is just to angle up a little bit like this. You could find it and then just angle up. So using the ultrasound, I'm sure the docs I trained with learned that there's less need for repeated passes, hence the less of a risk of traumatizing the tissue. You could see the local spread around the nerves to make sure you're in the right spot. You could also tell the difference between a blood vessel and other structures that may be hypodense or hypolucent or appear black, such as your local anesthetic or other fluid collections. Now, another way to locate the brachial plexus is to find the midline of the neck, scan to the side a little bit, find the thyroid, and move laterally to get the carotid. Further lateral, that's sternocleidomastoid, and behind it, you see the nerves starting to line up. That's your brachial plexus. Here we're following the, the nerves back towards the neck. That's a cervical foramen. Okay, they're black nerves, so it gets a little amorphous over here. It doesn't look circular or linear, it just gets black. And that's because the nerves are not taking a straight path. So they're not gonna look exactly like circles. Okay, once again, just you know, get this image into your brain as to what the nerves look like, how they look lined up close to the skin. You want them to be perpendicular. There are variants in how this appears um, in some patients. I have one coming up, I'll show you. The nerves, the C5 and C6 nerve can pass into the belly of the anterior scalene muscle, just like the piriformis, the sciatic nerve can sometimes be actually in the muscle or through the muscle, it can occur here. And this would appear as a black hole in the belly of the muscle, the anterior scalene, it will look like a blood vessel. So put some Doppler on it, see, make sure there's no color and no flow. And you could direct your needle to it and inject a few milliliters of local around it. There's no other way to get this unless you scan more proximal before the nerve enters the muscle, which that case should be very close to the cervical spine. And if you're not doing this for some interventional pain, I don't see any reason why you would do that. So speaking of interventional pain, um, I am using, I, I, I am integrating my anesthesia blocks into my pain practice. So when a patient comes to me with cervical radiculopathy and they have sensitivity in the interscaling fossa or the supraclavicular fossa, I'm doing an interscaling block in my office. I'm giving very little local and I'm diluting with saline. So I don't really, I've never seen a complication from doing an injection in this region, no phrenic nerve paralysis, nothing. And the patients get relief. And because of this, I'm able to avoid cervical, cervical epidurals in these patients, which I, I do cervical epidurals, but I probably do a smaller percentage than most pain doctors with the same volume I see because I don't need to do a cervical epidural. Just to give you an overview, cervical epidurals help, they work. They're great for patients who fail conservative therapy. However, you're so close to the spinal cord. If you can reduce the pain by less invasive means, and less invasive means a nerve block outside the spine, then why not? So that's what I did. Okay, this is that one of those variants I told you about. So this is a gentleman who actually came to my pain practice. He had cervical fusion, anterior and posterior, tons of hardware in his neck. He presented with atrophy of his left arm. He had tenels over his interscaling fossa, just pain in the neck, shooting down the arm, chronic pain. His neck's been filleted open from behind and from anterior. So his, he was a real big guy and his uh, neck was, was very wide. And you see there's a lot of soft tissue or hypertrophy or muscles out to the side and how deep this interscaling fossa was below the muscles. It's because his anatomy wasn't normal. 
he's had, he's had surgery here. So things looked a little different. And I did this for chronic pain, not for surgical anesthesia, but it's the same concept. If he came to you for a shoulder surgery, this is what you'd be looking at. You'd be looking at the nerves much deeper than they should be. And uh, you just need to keep that in mind and take a look at the whole patient and kind of get an idea as to what's been done to him and why he may have this appearance and just safely go through this extra muscle wave to get to your target. Here are the nerves coming in from this side, the needles coming in from this side. 